Hello, my name is Dan Carter. I'm an analyst at Phoenix Asset Management Partners, and I've been there for nearly five years. Um, Phoenix was founded in 1998 by Chief Investment Officer Gary Shannon, and we're based in southwest London uh, in Barnes. We're value investors. Um, you could describe our style as a sort of a hybrid between the Warren Buffett approach and the Phil Fisher approach. And we look to buy really good quality companies that earn high returns on their capital. We want them run by able and trustworthy management, and we want to make those investments at an attractive price. We manage 1.3 billion um, across various accounts. The Aurora Investment Trust is our vehicle that's available to retail investors. We're known for the depth of our research, and this allows us to have a high conviction portfolio, and currently in the Aurora Investment Trust, there are 15 positions. And throughout the history of Phoenix, our portfolios have had between 10 and 20 holdings. We've got a good long-term track record. Um, I'll show the Aurora Investment Trust record first since we started managing it in 2016. So you can see in that time frame, um, the NAV performance has been 65.9%, the share price performance 527 and the underlying benchmark, the FTSE All Share, has returned 64.8%. The, as I said, Phoenix has been around since 1998, and we run um, another fund called the Phoenix UK Fund from the very beginning, and that's run according to the same strategy as the Aurora Investment Trust. And so this is the longer-term uh, track record here. So over that time period, um, net of fees, it's returned more than twice the underlying benchmark with FTSE All Share and delivered a net 8.5% annualised. Um, one final slide before I um, go into a, a case study. And there's a lot of words, so I won't uh, read them all out. Uh, the key thing is we only get paid if we deliver returns in excess of the benchmark. Um, there's no management fee. There's a one-third performance fee of any outperformance. And importantly, there's a clawback. So if we give back that outperformance over the following three years, um, that performance fee is clawed back. And so now I'm going to give um, a case study that hopefully uh, gives a taste of our investment approach. It's a very typical uh, type of investment we make at Phoenix uh, that can end up in the uh, Aurora Investment Trust. So bums on seats. This is an important driver of the returns for the business I'm about to talk about. I'm not going to name the company just yet. I'm going to give a few slides of clues and see if anyone uh, in the audience can, can guess what the company is. Um, so importantly, this company has a great long-term track record. Um, it's delivered a growth in cash earnings per share of over 13% compounded since the early 90s. So that's really important. In part, this is driven by a really great track record of retaining key staff. And in this industry, that is so, so, so important. It's actually hard to overstate how important that is in this industry. And you can see that in 2013, this business had an average length of service of their managers of just over nine years, and that's consistently grown. And in the last year, that was over 14 years. And this is helped by the fact that they're generous with bonuses and free shares. And so since 2007, this business has paid um, roughly 50% of their profit after taxes in the form of bonuses and free shares to their employees. And importantly, this has been going to uh, staff on the front line. So 95% of these bonuses are going to staff below the board level and over 90% to staff that work in their... Um, actually, I can't say that because it would give it away. Um, <laughs> Can anyone guess what the company is? I know it's not a lot of information. No? Not quite. Well, not at all, actually, but I thought someone <laughs> might say that. <laughs> um, the company's actually Weatherspoons, and I thought potentially um, we wouldn't get it right because they received some terrible PR yeah, in the pandemic, and there's perhaps a, a misconception that this is a business that doesn't treat its employees very well. You can see this headline from The Sun. Weatherspoon's boss, Tim Martin, tells all 40,000 staff to go and find jobs in Tesco's. I mean, that's ridiculous. He didn't say that. Um, in fact, let's actually listen to what he did, in fact, say, if this works. If you're offered a job at a supermarket, many of you will want to do that. If you think it's a good idea, do it. You I can completely understand it. If you've worked for us before, I promise you we'll give you first preference if you want to come back. And we will obviously completely understand that you don't want to wait around for us to reopen. But deeply appreciate your work. Uh, I've just so much enjoyed talking to you in my pub calls uh, over the weeks. And best of luck. So I, 
So I think it's quite reasonable. He said to his staff, um, if you don't want to take the gamble that we're still around in a few months and you've got this job offer from, say, a supermarket, Tesco's were seeking 20,000 highs at the time, then I understand if you uh, want to take that job. Um, but he wasn't asking staff to leave. Um, but it doesn't really matter what I think. The date is there. You've seen it. This is a company that employees like working at. Otherwise, they wouldn't stay there for so long. And Tim Martin's key to the investment case in Weatherspoons. We really admire him at Phoenix. Uh, we think he's one of the best retailers in the UK. And importantly, he owns 24% of the company, and the vast majority of his net worth is invested in Weatherspoon stock. So as shareholders, we're aligned with the management team here. Tim's business uh, inspiration is this guy, Sam Walton. is the founder of Walmart. And where relevant, Tim has adopted the approach of Sam Walton and Walmart and applied those lessons to the UK pub industry. And I'm going to mention uh, three tenets of the uh, Sam Walton philosophy that um, I think are key to the Weatherspoons approach. So one is this idea of driving volumes and not just short-term profitability margins. Uh, the second is this idea of in-the-trenches leadership, getting out there on the front lines, talking to your um, employees, talking to your customers, visiting your competitors, and using this data to make decisions. And the third is empower your employees. They're the ones that are interacting with the customers every day, and you need them to make the right decision on behalf of them and the business, and you need to align them with the success of the business so they're incentivized to do so. So sticking with that point on empowering employees, um, I want to mention this business, Richer Sounds. Uh, they actually won a uh, Guinness World Record in the 90s for the highest sales per square foot of any retailer um, in the world at the time. And they were founded by a guy called Julian Richer. He wrote a good book called The Richer Way. And this business was well known, or is well known, for how it has an employee-first approach. And Julian Richer understood that it was key to treating employees well and empowering them because they were the one that drove the success of the business. And so Tim actually got Julian Richer to come in as a consultant and help them implement systems to take on board employee feedback and make decisions off the back of it. And so they came up with an idea called Tell Tim. And the first Tell Tim was actually staff asking for name badges to be removed. And they didn't like it in a pub where punters would come in and use their first name to refer to them. It was overly familiar. And uh, management at Weatherspoons didn't quite agree. They'd actually copied the name badge idea from a competitor they respected. But they listened to employees and they... Um, they dropped the name badge, and it's not been asked uh, to be brought back since. Um, I could have come up with a lot of examples of, of small things this business gets right by talking to employees, but I've had to choose a couple. Uh, another one is they had a Swedish employee. He recommended that the business stock this uh, brand that wasn't very well known at the time, and since then, it's Copperberg. It's become a huge success in the UK, and no one sells more of it in the on-trade than Weatherspoons. And then I've got a third example, which is uh, from this year. Tim had the idea this year to discount Guinness to £2.99 across all their pubs, so including their expensive airport locations, in the run-up to St. Patrick's Day. And he took this idea to their Thursday big operations meeting where they have employees and pub managers and area managers all come together and they debate these, these ideas and have back and forth. And the idea was shot down. And in fact, in an interview Tim gave, he said 70% of his ideas get rejected. And of the other 30%, 90% get improved because of this employee feedback. So this isn't a business where what Tim says goes. It's a business that empowers employees, lets them have an input into how things are done, and that's why they're able to be successful. The other tenant I said that they um, adopted was this idea of volumes over margin. And you can see this green line is the operating margin of Weatherspoon since they listed in the early 90s, which has been declining ever since. Yet despite that, the blue bars show that sales per pub, the amount of volume this business is driving through each of their outlets is increasing consistently. And the net effect of this, which is most important, is, again, that slide I showed earlier, that the cash earnings per share to shareholders have been compounding at 13%. So how are they able to drive volumes? Well, it's retail. You have to get a lot of things right. Um, and that's why I talked about that um, employee feedback. You have to get loads of little decisions right. But one of the things Weatherspoons are famous for is the value they offer. And so I thought I'd show that in a few slides here. So on this slide, I show what some of their competitors have been paying for various brands of beer to stock it in their pubs. And next to it, I show what Weatherspoons, at the same point in time, were able to sell it at retail. So if you was one of these publicans under one of this umbrella company... Uh, at the time, you were paying £2.30 at cost to stock Carlsberg in your pub. At the very same time, 
Weatherspoons were selling that for one pound forty nine. Well, you had to mark that up because you had to cover cover your uh, overheads, utilities, wages. So um, if you had a Weatherspoons nearby or open up nearby, you was in real trouble. You couldn't even buy your beer at the price Weatherspoons could sell it at. Another way of uh, looking at the value they offer, um, we look across the country at a number of Weatherspoons pubs that have a Green King nearby, and we track a basket of goods to see how the price comparison uh, comes through, and you can see that on average Weatherspoons is about 25 to 30% cheaper than Green King. So it's just another anecdote to show um, how good their value is. And so the question now might be, how are they able to offer such attractive prices? Well, that's the name of the presentation, Bums on Seats. It's driving volume through your pubs that enables them to do this. And, and it works in a number of ways. I can't go through all of them in, in the time I've got. But one of the um, ways that they do it is by leveraging their scale of suppliers. And actually, at the end of um, 2021, they announced a 20-year deal with Budweiser to supply them with beer. And it's turned into a bit of a deal of the century because inflation came in. Um, and if they were to renegotiate this contract now, they wouldn't get the same terms that they received back then. Um, in fact, the deal might have been too good, so Budweiser are trying all sorts of tricks to try and renegotiate this contract or get out of it, and Weatherspoons have had to take them to court. So it's in the courts at the moment, and there's a hearing in July. But regardless of how that turns out, I think it demonstrates how aggressively this business tries to get value on behalf of its customers and drive prices down from suppliers. And then the third tenant is this idea of in-the-trenches leadership. Tim spends more time visiting the pubs than he does in head office, he visits about 20 pubs uh, a week. And here you can see in this quote that he believes frequent, frequent visits to pubs by management is the key to their success. We try and copy Tim when we analyse Weatherspoons from the outside. We try to visit their pubs, have a look at the local marketplace, visit competitors and see how they're doing. And uh, just this week I visited, or last week, sorry, I visited one of their newest pubs, the Stargazer. It's in the O2 in Greenwich, and they invested just under £3 million in this pub. And I went there on a Monday afternoon. There was no events on, and it was very, very quiet. There was hardly anyone in the whole O2. Despite this, there were people in the, um, the Weatherspoons. There was about 28 people uh, in the pub inside and out. It doesn't sound like a lot, um, but this is the pub next door. Uh, the Observatory, it's a Michelin Butler's pub. And you can see... Um, not doing quite as well. And actually, this tells the story of the whole, o whole O2 at the time. So the entrance is this uh, blue arrow at the bottom. You have an all bar one on your left as you walk in. Um, and then you have to walk all around this avenue uh, before you get to Weatherspoons, which is furthest away. On that avenue, there's all sorts of uh, bars and restaurants, and most were empty. Um, some had one table occupied, um, but the Frankie and Benny's had no one in it, for instance. And then you had the Nicholson's pub that I just showed. And the Weatherspoons was furthest away. So it was the furthest pub away from the entrance and had the most people in it. And this isn't one of the most attractive Weatherspoons from a price perspective. It's priced for, just like the airports are, for high volumes when the events are on. So I was quite surprised by that. Um, but then you go back to the value they offer. Um, this shows the price at that Weatherspoons versus the Mitchell and Butler's pub next door and the All Bar 1 by the entrance. Uh, a pint, one pound cheaper in the Weatherspoons. If you want fish and chips and a drink, 40% cheaper in the Weatherspoons. Uh, I love chocolate brownies, so uh, you get a great deal there too. Um, so let's just take a pause. So hopefully this has, gives a bit of insight into the depth of work we do at Phoenix. Um, we try and do the research that tells us, do we have a great management team that we trust? And is this business winning versus its competitors? Um, if we get both of those right... Then we look at the third point, which is buy this at an attractive valuation. So let's, let's talk about the valuation. How do you value a business that's in the pub industry when the long-term trend isn't too great? Uh, you can see the number of pubs in the UK in 2000 was over 60,000, and it's approaching 45,000 at the moment. And really, we don't think Weatherspoons is even a pub in the traditional sense. So you can see how... Um, in 1998, they added the Curry Club. 2002, they opened all day for breakfast. Um, in 2017, they added an app for table service, added pizzas, and they added refillable coffee machines. And really, Weatherspoons have become an all-day venue, and they're much more a restaurant, really, than a traditional pub. And the numbers back this up. Um, the mix of sales that uh, come from food has doubled from 18% in 2000 to 36% uh, last year. And two-thirds of all their customers now have something to eat 
when they visit a Weatherspoons. So a minority of customers are actually only drinking uh, when they visit a Weatherspoons. So uh, rather than trying to value a business that's in the pub industry, we're valuing a business that's in the, the hospitality casual dining trade, which has a um, rosier prospects in comparison. And when we estimate all the future cash flows, we think this business will uh, pay to shareholders over time. We come to an intrinsic value of £12 per share, which gives a, an upside of 70% of today's prices. So we're happy to own it at this price. We see good value, but we wouldn't actually make an investment at today's prices. And that's because we like to have at least 100% upside when we initiate a position. And what really excites us today is we believe that the portfolio in the Aurora Investment Trust has 130% upside. Um, and that's the portfolio here. Um, and that's the reason that Weatherspoons is in this bucket at the bottom, the other's less than 3%, um, despite having, um, we believe, decent upside. We think the rest of the portfolio in aggregate has a higher upside. And with that, I'll go to questions. Um, I am joined by one of our partners uh, from Phoenix, uh, Steve Tatters, who's um, over there, if you want to wave, Steve. Um, and so between us, we, we'll try and answer all your questions. That's really interesting. Thank you very much, Dan. Do we have any questions for Dan, please? Mm, shy. Over here, please speak. Hello. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I like some of your holdings. Uh, RHIM, I think, had a good day today. Um, so they got, uh, but uh, something that I'm not so thrilled about is that hotel chocolate. You, you you must think that that's a good upside. But if I look at the share price uh, return over the past five or ten years, it looks abysmal. Yes, yeah, it's, um, it's a business we've followed for a while. Um, we didn't uh, participate in the IPO despite knowing the company, and that's because the uh, valuation uh, wasn't there for us at the time. And we followed the journey in detail. And uh, after recent pullbacks, we've, we've seen a window to, to get in with a, um, we think, a really attractive upside to intrinsic value. Um, does that answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you, you talked a lot about the, the Weatherspoons case study, which I thought was really, really interesting. Um, and Tim Martin, quite a divisive personality, maybe not fairly portrayed in the media. Um, but how much store do you put in the management um, when you do all this research? How much of it is um, your kind of on the ground? How much is the financial analysis and how much is the management and, and meeting the management? The management is key. It's really, really important. And I believe, um, I haven't been at Phoenix since the beginning um, in 1998, but um, speaking to Gary and speaking to the team, I can see that it's become a more and more important part of the process over time. And it's because the management, they're, they're the ones that are deciding where capital is allocated. Um, you, you know, the classic value traps a lot of the time come from seeing a company with good assets and good prospects. But then if you have a management there that destroys value and doesn't let shareholders realise that value, then um, what's it worth? So really, really important and um, spend just as much time on, on management as we do the business. The two are key. Um, and the other question I had was about kind of sell discipline. With such a concentrated portfolio and such a limited number of holdings, what does it take for you to decide to exit a position? Well, I'm lucky in that being an analyst, my job is to uh, work on the holdings and, um, and I don't have to make, make the sell decisions. But, um, but really it's about um, it's two things. It's upside to intrinsic value, but also risk. So um, if there's a company we know really well, we've got really good depth of knowledge, um, then the, the barrier to, to selling that position will be higher than, than a company that's just been through the process recently um, that we don't know as well, even if it might have slightly more upside to IV, because there's more chance of us being wrong. Um, so. Okay. Any other questions, please? Gentlemen here, please. Speak. Uh, looking at uh, your list of companies, uh, Ryanair, flashed past very quickly uh, with a somewhat different approach to Tim Martin, I would suggest. Um, if I bought your chairs uh, three years ago, I'd be up about 30% at the moment, according to some statistics, statistics I looked at today. However, if I had bought one month ago, three months ago, six months ago, 12 months ago, or five years ago, I'd be underwater at this point in time. Uh, clearly you think there's an upside in the uh, portfolio. When do you think it will be realised, accepting that the future is more important uh, than the past, but the past gives us some kind of a steer of what the future might be like? 
I don't want to disappoint on this answer, but we can't uh, predict when, when we think that might happen. Um, but we do know over the uh, sort of the the 20-plus years that we've been in operation, that when we add value to the portfolio and we build that upside to intrinsic value, good returns have followed, and we've tracked that from the very beginning. Um, we don't know when. We can't predict when, but um, that's value investing, I guess. If you, if, you, if you put value in the portfolio, you can't be sure uh, what the catalyst is or when the value accrues to you as a shareholder, but, but it's coming, um, if you're patient. But, yeah, can't make a prediction. <laughs> Okay, and the other question I had was on um, phrases. Is it the number one holding? Yeah. And again, another um, maybe slightly controversial uh, owner or, or ownership history, management history. Um, do, do, do you think people misunderstand the Ashleys? You know, what, what, is there a misconception there, or are they unfairly portrayed? That was the answer I was going to give. It's, it's similar to the uh, Weatherspoons case in that regard. It's uh, probably a misunderstood owner, uh, manager. Um, both businesses have uh, management that are aligned with their large shareholding. Um, both businessmen get a bad, um, don't get the best PR. Um, and both business models are really about driving volume and having a really good sort of back-end efficient uh, business. So quite similar investment cases, really. Um. Question here, please? Oh, sorry, where, where's the microphone? Sorry, sir. Yeah. Um, I saw in your holdings you had uh, Netflix. Uh, what um, What is your target split between UK shares and, and non-UK shares? Yeah, so it's, it's predominantly a, a UK fund. Um, there is a leeway to go up to 20% in um, non-UK businesses. Um, and at the moment, you've got, you've got Netflix and, and Ryanair there. Um, though the Ryanair example gives a good sort of, you know, you've got EasyJet and Ryanair, very similar businesses, similar market, and one counts in that bucket and one doesn't just because of where the, the listing is. But, yeah, 20% max. Gentlemen here, thank you. Uh, is your investment process um, steered by ESG criteria at all? ESG uh, comes into the process. Um, we're big believers that um, being good corporate citizens is actually good for shareholder value. If, um, if your business model is at odds with what society wants, then that can cause issues down the line and you should incorporate that in your intrinsic value. Um, so it's in the process, yeah. Any other questions for Dan, please? Gentlemen here, please, Pete. Thank you. Uh, very interesting presentation, thank you. You mentioned that the Aurora, Aurora uh, Investment Trust is similar to the Phoenix UK Fund. Apart from them being a fund and investment trust, how does the performance compare? I don't have the answer to that, Steve. Do you? <coughs> Hi. Um, I mean, on one of the slides, the Phoenix UK fund is a Cayman domiciled fund, so it's not suitable for retail investors um, in the UK. But you could see the return was 8.5% per annum, the annualised return, and that's what investors got in their hand. The Aurora Investment Trust's only been going for five and a half years. Um, it's exactly the same portfolio. So we, we say look at the long-term track record of the Phoenix UK fund, and it'll give you an idea of what we hope Aurora will do in a similar time period. But there's no other... The, the holdings are the same, the, 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 the portfolio split is the same. The, the holdings are not exactly the same, but they're very similar. But, but they're, not, they're not the same to the absolute percentage, but, okay. but very but similar. Very similar. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Dan, please? No? Okay. Dan, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.